Maribel live. I see that so many people are right here. I want to say hi to uh, Kalyani, Kiri, Ryan, and Celine saying that it's her first time here. Welcome. So happy that you guys can be here. Now, what this is all about, what since I know we have a first timer here. So what we do here is you guys ask your questions on Twitter and for a chance to get them answered by me and to basically create a lesson plan for you guys in the following live. So as you guys may or may not know, I was a tutor for quite some time and I understand how much a tutor cost and this, this session, basically this tutoring session and this live is about $100 worth of free tutoring that you guys get every single Sunday. That is my gift to you. Why? Because I understand what it's like to be in your shoes, in your position and not understanding chemistry and needing all the help that you can get and wanting to find a resource. So I want to be that resource for you guys. So happy you're here. Happy you can uh, learn today and that we can jump right in to all the amazing things that I have planned for you guys. So I got plenty of questions uh, this time around, which is awesome. So the main questions that we're going to be going over today, since I'm picking questions from this past week where it was a bunch of Twitter questions, I had people asking from things from uh, quantum numbers. That's what we're going to start off with. Then electromagnetic spectrum, a couple questions from their understanding all those formulas. Same with an empirical and molecular formula question. And then finally, we'll end with a uh, precipitation and solubility question, kind of going into like net ionic equations, limiting reactants. That one's uh, pretty jam-packed there. So that's what we'll be going over today. If you're watching the replay and after this live is done, you'll find uh, I'm going to actually post a comment and pin it uh, to the top so you can see all the timestamps. All that is is me stating uh, what exact time you, you can actually go to like quantum numbers or precipitate and solubility. So that'll be set for you guys. All right. So I'm going to be going over the questions that were already asked me to me on Twitter. So that's how the format is going to be. Um, so why don't we jump right into quantum numbers, understanding what are they and what is going on. All right. So quantum numbers, a lot of times, um, the main thing I just kind of want you to think about with quantum numbers, because I know it's so complex, is it's really focusing on electrons and where those electrons are in their orbitals. So quantum numbers are a way for us to figure out where is that electron in that orbital. So that's kind of what I want you to, to assume or to, to think about. And then essentially there are four different quantum numbers, okay? So the first quantum number is the principle. So that is described as N, that's the symbol for it. And the main thing for N and what this is all talking about, it's just talking about the size of the orbital or how, how strong or how high in energy that orbital is. So think of it this way, the higher the number, the more energy that orbital will have. So in this case, like you'll see n is either one, two, or three, depending on what row it's on in your periodic table. All right. And then we'll go into how to find all the different types. So don't worry about that. Okay. So the next one is going to be angular momentum, and that's going to be shown or represented as L. That is going to be very important. There's actually a, a table that I want you guys to memorize and to just know, okay? So this is the table on the screen that I really highly, highly recommend you guys knowing, okay? So because you you will not be given this on your exam or any quiz, uh, they expect you to memorize this. What this is, is it tells you the overall shape of the orbital. So remember, there are four different types of orbital shapes or different orbitals in general. Our first one being S. So let's show that. Our first one being S, and that's going to be the lowest in energy. All right. So our L is always going to be zero for S, all right, or for actually, yeah, for S. And then for our next orbital shape, which continues on in the um, like how high in energy it is or how strong it is, it's going to be P. So P is going to have an angular momentum or L is going to be one and we're going to keep going. So D would be L is equal to two. And lastly, our strongest orbital uh, shape or type of orbital would be F, which is L is equal to three. Like I said, please know this. OK, that's going to be really, really important. I recommend just memorizing it. Um, by the way, everything that you're going to see here, all of these 
nice little tables and um, constants and formulas I actually made for you guys. So make sure to check out the description box. Uh, you can check that right now or check that later. Uh, all of that, I actually created a free survival guide, chemistry survival guide that has all the formulas you will need to know for chemistry one and chemistry two. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, I know a lot of people, it saved a lot of people from flipping through the book or forgetting what a formula was, okay? So all of these charts are in there as well. Okay. So let's keep going. Next one. The next quantum number is uh, magnetic. So what this is really talking about, it's talking about the orientation of our orbital. And what I want you to think about here, what that means is let's say if we were looking at the different types of P orbitals, and there are three different types. There's going to be one that is here. There's three different types. So there's PX, PY, and PZ. So if we're looking at, at P, there are three different types or three different subshells is essentially what it's called, where PX is aligned on our X axis, PY on the Y axis, and PZ on the Z axis. So that magnetic um, quantum number is essentially telling us, is it PX? Is it PY? Is it PZ? How is the orientation? How is that, that uh, orbital like shaped? Is it on the X axis, Y, and so on? Okay, that's what we're talking about here. And what's going to be really important here with our uh, magnetic quantum number is just the fact that it depends on whatever L is, all right? So knowing L is going to come in handy because this is going to help us understand uh, what our ML would be. So this is not a one, by the way. This is negative L to positive L. And what I want you to think of is let's say if our L was two, okay, our M sub L would then would have been our negative L, so negative 2, all the numbers in between, so negative 1, 0, and then 1 to 2. So that's what I mean by a negative L, so like negative 2, all, and all the numbers in between to a positive L, which is 2 in this case because we stated that that's what our L was, okay? And everything that I'm talking about here with our quantum numbers, these are just the possibilities. There will be, I, I will be going over a specific question that actually has the amount of electrons and they ask you to find the specific M sub L. Okay, so I'll go over all the different possibilities that you may see. Okay, the last one is talking about the spin of the electron. And what that's essentially stating is if the electron is either spinning up or facing up or going down, okay? So if it is a, if it's actually landing on top, it's going to be a positive one half, and that's our m sub s. And then same thing now, if it's going down, if the electron arrow or head is on the bottom, that's going to be a negative one half, all right? So this is how we're going to just use all of these different things, okay? So these are the four quantum numbers I highly recommend to know. Okay, so let's keep going. What if we were trying to find the quantum numbers of a 3p orbital? So this is just an example. If they initially gave you a 3p orbital. Okay, so I know 3p. Let's, let's just decode and see what is hidden within this, this information, just 3p. Well, that 3 is actually going to tell us what n is. So whatever coefficient we have in front is actually telling us what our principal or our n is for our quantum number. So n is equal to 3. Next, our P is actually going to tell us what type of orbital, right? It tells us our orbital. It's a P orbital. So there, it's actually going to be L is equal to 1 based on this table, right? So going back, based on this table, P is equal to 1. Okay. And then next, if we wanted to keep going with this, our M sub L, and I know I'm going to have a lot on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, let me see if I can erase a little bit of it. But our M sub L is going to be a lot, a lot of different variations. So this is talking about since we don't have our electrons for like 3P raised to, let's say, the third, since we don't know what how many electrons we have, this is just talking about all the possible quantum numbers that we can have. So M sub L would then be, remember, that was negative L to positive L. So that then that means we have negative 1 zero and positive one. So that's our M sub L. And then in this case, once again, since we were not given um, how many electrons we have, right, we don't know how many electrons we have, then our M sub S is just going to be a plus or minus one half. So that's going to be that for this case. Okay, let's keep going. Let's say if we were given the actual amount of electrons, 
and we'll see that here. So that's the main difference between this one and the previous one. So the fact that we actually are given the amount of electrons is, is going to tell us, okay, we're only going to have one M sub L and one M sub S. Okay, so that's what that's kind of like what's telling us because it's so specific and it specifically tells you how many electrons there are, then we're going to get specific in our quantum numbers. Because remember, quantum numbers were essentially telling us that, okay, that's where that electron will be in, and where that electron will be is that specific orbital as well. Okay, so it's think of it, it's like you're trying to figure out the location of that electron essentially. Okay, so let's go over this again. Remember, our coefficient in front is actually telling us it's n, so n is equal to two. Next, we'll look at our p orbital. So that actually defines l, so l is equal to one based on that chart that we talked about previously. And then finally, that electron, so we have five electrons, tells us exactly what our m sub l and our m sub s will be, okay? So let's start off with m sub l. Now with m sub l, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw in the electrons. And we, were, we have five electrons, okay? Now, this is going to go back to something known as Hund's rule. What that essentially is saying is that electrons don't want to be grouped together if they don't have to be. So what that means is we're actually going to fill, actually not completely fill, we're going to put one electron in each subshell, then come back, okay? So we have one electron, two, three, come back, four, and five. All right, so we saw how I did that. I'm going to do that one more time. It's very important. So this is Hund's rule. So we only put one electron, go to the next one. Two, three, come back, four, and five. Okay, so that's how we want to fill our electrons um, whenever we're, we're filling these subshells. So where I left off was right here. That's the electron that I'm focused on. That's what's going to tell us what M sub L is and M sub S is. So since it landed in... Um, m sub l is equal to zero. And I did that, by the way. Remember that, actually, let me go back real quick. That m sub l would have been negative l to positive l. So all the possibilities were negative one, zero, and positive one. And that's why I put those all together. Another thing is there are three subshells for our p orbitals, remember? Uh, for s, there's only one. For d, there are five. And for f, there are seven. So now that I saw that, I know that, okay, well, m sub l is equal to zero. Next, this is facing down. The fact that that electron is actually spinning down tells us that m sub s is then equal to a negative one half. And that's what we get. And then finally, we'll just bring back our other uh, quantum numbers and those are our four quantum numbers. So I do see that as a potential test question. The last one that I'm gonna do on quantum numbers is a trick question. So. I've seen this a lot on multiple choice questions. Um, if you are taking the AP exam, I highly recommend writing this one down or you know just making sure you go over this because this is a this is a good AP question. Um, and I've I just I've seen this so many times, so it's possible, okay? Um, or even just on your quiz. Um, so this specific one is telling us which set of quantum numbers is invalid. So what I want you to think of with this is it's essentially going to be telling you or trying to trick you. And what's going to be important, and we'll go over each one, what's going to be important is knowing all of the different orbitals and knowing here, I give it this way. So like if this was our periodic table, knowing that all the different blocks that we have, this goes back to electron configuration, that let's say this is our, there's only two here. So like this is our S block, our P block, D block, and F block, right? So that's going to be important, knowing those different blocks for quantum numbers, um, and that goes back to electron configuration. And it's going to be important because sometimes, like let's say if they gave you something that was, um, let's say, 1p, right? That's not possible. So there is no 1p. Instead, the first you know p orbital that we actually see is 2p. So it's stuff like that that they're going to try to trick you on, and that's what's impossible or invalid. Okay, so that's something that they could do. Let's keep going with this one. Let's start off with a. Let's just see would this work. So a says uh, n is equal to three. That means, and once again, three just defines which row it's in. Okay, so it's in the third row. Next, it tells us l is equal to two. Okay, well if l is equal to two. Just wanted to bring that back. Um, if L is equal to two, that tells us that 
it's a d orbital okay well can we have so far can we have 3d yes we can right so far that's that's valid because we can have a 3d orbital and then next they're telling us what uh, a possible thing that we could have for m sub l is 2 and we'll keep going and see is that correct well if l is equal to 2 then m sub l has the possibility of being negative 2 negative 1 0 1 and 2 so yes that checks out and m sub s can be positive 1 half well yes they didn't tell us how many electrons there are so that one is fine and i'm going to keep going so now let's look at the next one and well n is equal to 2 okay so now we're in now we're here now we're in this row and remember so the only thing in this row that we can possibly see is the s or the p so we can't have a 2d that's not possible okay so let's just keep that in mind and then so we have okay that's two well l is equal to one okay well if l is equal to one then it's p so so far this is 2p and that's okay because here this two does go to p that's totally fine uh, next m sub l is equal to zero that's fine again become because m sub l could have been negative one zero and one and then um, and then m sub s is totally fine since it's a negative one half. Okay, so let's check the last one. So then here, n is equal to one, okay? So if n is equal to one, that means it's in the first row. In that first row, the only thing that we will see is s, okay? We, we're not gonna see p, d, or f, any of those orbitals, it's not possible. The only thing that we have here, and I know I didn't draw this perfectly, but remember what's actually up here is a hydrogen, right? And then right here is uh, helium. So, and this is really, really one. Okay, so that's only gonna be um, S. So then in this case, if L is equal to one, that's telling us that we have one P, not possible. That's invalid because we cannot have one, like one doesn't go to P, it goes to only S. But however, two does go to P. So like, that's what I want you to think of. And that's essentially the answer is C. And, and yes, it's because, um, if L is equal to one, it means that the P orbital would have uh, one P, which doesn't make sense. All right, so that's how I want, I want you guys to approach this type of question. Like I said, I have seen this several times on exams, AP exams, just everywhere, okay, even homework questions. All right, let's move on. So that was quantum numbers. I hope that made some sense and it makes it so much easier to just understand um, what's going on with quantum numbers. Like I said, if you guys need to know the table and any of these types of constants or equations that I'm going over, please check the description box. I made a free uh, chemistry survival guide just for you guys to download and have all of your um, constants and formulas right there in one place. So that's in the description box really of every single video. So, all right, so what we're gonna be going over for the electromagnetic spectrum is just different types of questions that are asking for wavelength, frequency, and energy. So those are the main three that you will potentially see on an exam or, or whatnot. And these are the main formulas that we will be going over. So this is what I'm gonna keep ref referencing throughout this entire time. And also uh, these constants should be given to you as well. Uh, not this one, by the way, but uh, these constants should be. Now the formulas typically are not given to you. Those are, expect you're expected to actually memorize those, unfortunately, okay. So now, um, and actually I just got a question. Uh, do you have notes on quantum numbers? Not yet, I don't. Uh, that's something that I don't have just yet, but you could always rewatch this video and go over the quantum numbers that I mentioned before. Okay, so that's the main thing. Um, now, with the electromagnetic spectrum, the main equations that I'm going to be focused on today are these three. Okay, so those are the most common ones that you will typically see. And by the way, I'm just going to explain what everything means, every single constant, so or every single symbol that's going to help us understand what everything is. So this is frequency. I've also seen people write it as an F. It really just depends on your instructor. Uh, but this is how I learned it personally and how I've seen most professors teach it. So this is uh, frequency. And then C is going to be the speed of light which is a constant, and you'll either see 2.998 uh, times 10 to the eighth, or you'll see 3.0 times 10 to the eighth. I'm gonna use 3.0 times 10 to the eighth. Like I said, it really just depends on your instructor and what they, what value they provide you with, okay? 
So, and your units are very, very important here, all right? So this is actually gonna seem, after I explain this, it's gonna seem a lot simpler and a lot easier because it just feels like you're plugging in values to a formula. But where I see students go wrong is that they forget about their units and forget to convert um, like nanometers to meters first. So that is something that I highly recommend just double checking, are all of your units gonna cancel and give you what you actually want? Okay, and we'll go over that. So. The next thing is this kind of funky backwards looking Y that is known as wavelength, all right? So that's the symbol for wavelength. And then this is another one. This is our energy formula where H is known as Planck's constant and that's given as this constant, that's gonna be given. And then our speed of light again, divided by our wavelength and so on. And then this again is another way to calculate our energy. However, if it, it's basically just calculating energy when you're given your frequency, since we already have Planck's constant. So these are the three we're gonna mention, we're gonna talk about today. Let's just dive in right now. Okay, so the first question says, what is the frequency of green light, which has a wavelength of 490 nanometers? Okay, so, we're given our wavelength, so that, that's what I like to identify with these types of questions because it helps me identify what formula I will then use. So I have my wavelength and I'm asked to figure out what my frequency is. So think of it this way, all you need for your formula is something that has wavelength and something that has frequency. So our formula in this case will be the first one because that's when that is actually solving for frequency and we really know what c is that's a constant that is the speed of light and like i said you could either use the first one the 2.998 or the 3.0 times 10 to the eighth okay so all i have to do now and some people think some people think um that you instantly just plug everything in however that would have been wrong and the reason for it is because our units our speed of light is in meters however our wavelength is typically given to us in nanometers, okay? So nanometers needs to be converted first to meters. And I'm gonna say that again, because that's the mistake I always see students make and I don't want you to miss this on your test, okay? So with these, these types of questions, whenever you're using these formulas and you're given wave, wavelength in nanometers, please convert it to meters first, okay? That's gonna be your initial step pretty much always if you're given wavelength in nanometers. All right, so change nanometers to meters first. That's what we're gonna do. All right, so step one, change nanometers to meters. This goes back to the metric system and talking about conversions again. All right, so uh, going back to conversions, I'm gonna start off with our given, which was the 490 nanometers. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna align the units so aligning, I'm using this conversion factor where one nanometer is equal to 10 to the negative ninth meters. Okay, so here I have one nanometer, that's gonna be aligned on the bottom, so then those nanometers and nanometers can cancel, and then we're left with meters, so multiply straight across, and this is the value that we would have gotten. Um, and then next, after I'm done with that, all I have to do, because we have meters now, is plug it into the formula. So it's just one additional step in the very beginning to change it to nanometers to meters, then you plug everything in because perfect, we have our meters all, you know, we have all of our units that will properly cancel. So all I'm gonna do is divide. So I'll start off with our speed of light, which is C, and that's what I put on top, divided by the converted uh, wavelength in meters now on bottom. And we'll note that our meters and meters will cancel. And what's actually gonna happen is we're gonna be left with seconds to the negative first. So, and the reason for this, by the way, is this is essentially saying that it's one over seconds divided by really one, okay? And, and that's the same thing, one over S is actually equal to S to the negative first. So that's essentially the same exact thing. So after I divide those two values, that's gonna give us this value. Uh, one more thing. So frequency is either, the units for it, is either seconds to the negative first or in hertz. So it's really the same exact thing. Here we go. So one hertz is actually equal to one to the, um, to one second to the negative first. So this is gonna be helpful to know just in case you are asked to find frequency in hertz and they don't provide you with that. Uh, typically they do, but just in case. It's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, but like I said, frequency, the unit for that is seconds to the negative first, first or hertz, all right? So that's how to find frequency. I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna make sure I, I don't have any questions 
um, or to answer any questions. Um, Ryan says, this stuff doesn't seem like chemistry to me. Will this be on the AP chem test? Yes, it will. So is this chem? Yes, it is. Um, so this is part of uh, the electro electromagnetic spectrum. And you'll note, by the way, guys, um, the reason why you learn so many different things and what chemistry actually does, it, it's a combination of physics and math. And later on, when you get higher into chemistry, it can even combine uh, like biology in it. Um, <laughs> that's not as scary as it sounds, I promise. Um, but yeah, so what you're seeing right now is a combination of physics and chemistry together. They do go hand in hand. A lot of the sciences do overlap. So this is this is um, chemistry. <laughs> um, real quick, let me just make sure like that everyone kind of, if you haven't gone through this section just yet, you will. Uh, this could be later on. I know everyone is in different sections. That's why I, I wanted to do these different types of topic-based um live sessions now and ha and give you a chance to ask your questions so I can have more people getting, you know, their questions answered and going over more topics in one. Um, so what this essentially is talking about, what the electromagnetic spectrum is talking about, it's talking about different waves, different types of waves. So um, when we're looking at wavelengths and uh, kind of I'm trying to like summarize this in a nutshell, um, think of it this way. It's essentially telling us how we look at visible light. So that's going to be a major concept with the electromagnetic spectrum is like we're looking at, you know, x-rays or radio waves or specifically the, the visible light uh, seeing, you know, is this going to be red as to how we see it or purple or blue and so on. So a lot of these questions are based off of that. Um, when you're looking at a wavelength, that's essentially just telling us or it can help us figure out what, what color we're actually seeing. All right, and then um, and then same thing goes now with frequency. Um, frequency is essentially saying how how strong that color is that that light. I don't want to say color. I want to say light. How strong that light is visible to us. So there's a lot to it. I know that you might not have gone over just yet. Right now, what we're doing is just going over the main types of questions that you will see for this. So getting familiar with it now is going to be very beneficial, I would definitely say. Um, and we'll keep going over it. But that's what I want you to kind of just understand. This is all talking about packets of light, which is photons, or really just how we see this visible light or how we see colors. Okay, so which is pretty cool uh, to understand how in the world our eyes can actually see like this shade of red or, you know, coral or whatnot. Okay, so let's continue on. Now, uh, let's say if we were asked to now find our energy, so calculate the energy of a gamma ray whose wavelength is that amount. So once again, we're given wavelength. So what do we have to do? We have to convert first from nanometers to meters. And what I like to do is still to identify what we have to help me figure out what formula we will be using. So since we're given our wavelength, now I'm gonna identify what formula we need. The reason why we need this specific formula is because we're asked to find energy, so E, and then we have just wavelength, and we know what H and C are. Those are specific constants. So these are both of our constants. H is, like I said, Planck's constant, which is this value, and C is the speed of light. So these are going to be on top, and we really have them. All we have to do is convert from nanometers to meters, then plug it in, okay? So that's what we'll do first. We'll convert nanometers to meters using the same exact conversion factor that we used before, and then after we align our units across so they can cancel, we'll get meters. So this is the new amount of meters that we will be using. And then um, all we have to do, and by the way, real quick, a little math trick for you guys, if you didn't want to punch this in, into your calculator, uh, whenever you're multiplying the same bases, like 10 and 10, your exponents actually add together. And that's how we got that negative uh, 13. So at the, that's how we got this. So that's how you can easily do it if in case you don't want to use a calculator or your calculator, you want to double check that your calculator actually did it right. So I've had some mistakes like that before. So next, we want to plug in everything into our formula, which is exactly what I did here. So H is Planck's constant. That's going to be given to you. And C is the speed of light. Once again, that constant will be given. And this is what we previously found. 
What we want to do first is multiply straight across and let's just go over how everything is going to cancel for your units and this is how you know you did it correctly. So energy is measured in joules. So and joules is like I said just some sort of type of way, some sort of unit to um, measure energy. You'll also see that with kilojoules later on. So your meters and your meters will cancel. Your seconds and seconds will cancel since that's that seconds was on the bottom and we'll be left just with joules, which is what we wanted. So this is the amount that we'll get overall and that's pretty much it. That, that's all we would have in this case. Um, I do want to go over real quick uh, sig figs because that's always important and I don't want you to miss anything on your exam. So looking back, how many sig figs do we have? We have three. So since we have three sig figs, we just care about rounding to three sig figs, and that's why at the end we'll have three sig figs. Uh, your constants don't matter. Those are going to stay the same. The only thing that we look at is what's actually given in the initial question. All right, so last one on uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And this one is talking about a photon. So photon, once again, packet of light, just a little packet of light, okay? So has an energy of that amount. So now we're given our energy and we're asked to find what, is, what its frequency is and what is its wavelength in nanometers. Let's start off with just identifying what our frequency is and figuring out what formula we will use. So we have our energy that was initially given to us. Now this is the formula that we will use because we are looking for frequency and we have the energy. Lastly, we know what H is because that's just a constant, that's Planck's constant. So now I'll plug everything into the formula. There's no need to change any units since we have joules and joules and those we cancel. And remember frequency has the unit of seconds to the negative first or hertz, which is really the same sort of uh, setup here, okay? So then our frequency, let me go ahead and keep going. Okay, so here, I just plugged everything in, there we go. Plugged in energy, that's what we initially had. Plugged in H, since that's what was given, right? That's just a constant. And then this is our frequency that we're trying to solve for. Next is we wanna get rid of this to really divide that over to get frequency by itself. So I'll divide both sides by that value. And then now these will cancel and joules and joules will cancel and that will give us seconds. And then now this is what our um, frequency would actually be. And then as I mentioned, I think I put that perfect. As I mentioned, this could have been seconds to the negative first or hertz depending on um, what your professor really prefers. I've seen either or, but uh, sometimes they prefer just hertz. Wouldn't be wrong though. Okay, one more thing with this. Let's mo move on to just finding the wavelength of this question and then we'll go to empirical and molecular formulas. Okay, so now let's find the wavelength. We have our energy again. Now this is what we're gonna use instead. So our, our energy is given and we wanna figure out what our wavelength is, okay? So we know what H and C are. Those are just constants that we were initially given. So I'm gonna plug everything in again. So plugging, ah, plugging everything in I just plugged in E and plugged in H and C and we're looking for that wavelength. So multiplying straight across and this is the value we will get. Let's go back to just looking at how everything's gonna cancel. So your seconds and seconds would cancel and that's it so far. Now that's why we have joules times meters. That's what's left over right here. Now what I wanna do next is to just figure out or find a way to get the wavelength by itself on the bottom. What we could do is we can multiply both sides by the wavelength and that'll cancel this out. And that's what we get so far. Okay, and then now the last thing that we wanna do is get rid of this to get the wavelength by itself. So we're gonna end up moving this and dividing both sides by that value. So when we do that, these cancel and our joules and joules cancel and we're left with meters and we're almost done. So that gives us meters, the last steps, because it specifically tells us that wavelength is measured in nanometers and they want it in nanometers, we now have to convert back to nanometers. So I'll go back using that conversion factor that we had previously and we'll align those meters and meters so they will cancel. So meters and meters will cancel. And then we're left with uh, that amount of nanometers and we're, we're done, okay? So that was pretty much, let me go back real quick. So that was pretty much what we had for those types 
of questions. Um, that was our overall form or actually our, our wavelength that we found previously. Okay. So um, highly recommend, like I said, if you guys need um, other help, by the way, everything that I'm answering here, if you guys are just joining or you're unfamiliar with how this setup is, is the questions that I'm answering right now are previous tweets that uh, students actually sent me their chemistry questions on Twitter. Um, and you can see it on the screen. That's how you actually do it. Just tweet me at hello, Melissa M. And put the hashtag of Ask Melissa Maribel. You could either take a picture of your chemistry question that you need help with, or you could even just write the chemistry topic. And um, it's all for a chance to get your question answered by me for the next live. So highly recommend doing that. I know more people are doing that. Um, and I'm just trying to answer as many questions as possible every single Sunday. All right. So that's what I'm doing now. Okay, so that was electro uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Now let's move on to empirical and molecular formulas. So the main difference between an empirical formula versus a molecular formula is just the fact that one is kind of like an educated guess and the other is the actual formula that you will see for that compound or for that molecule. So the empirical formula is more of a educated guess, okay? It's an estimation as to how many, let's say, um, how many carbons or hydrogens are within that molecule. And the molecular formula is exact. It's specifically going to be that amount. There's no question about it. There's no doubt about it, okay? So that's what I want you to kind of look at. Now, there are several steps to understanding uh, the em empirical and molecular formula. And I can see if I can put a video. I actually have two videos, one on the empirical formula and the other on the molecular formula with more examples and all the steps listed out as well. But of course, I'll go over that here as well. So I'll also put those in the chat right now. So if you need extra practice, I highly recommend checking those out. Um, I go over a lot of different types of questions that you can see there. So for this one specifically though, it's asking us to find the empirical and molecular formula of a compound. and they're giving us all of these values, right? So they're, they're giving us a percentage of carbon, a percentage of hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So, so far I know, at least in our empirical formula and molecular formula, that we're the elements that we're gonna see are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, now something that's very important besides the percentage here is they're giving us our molecular weight. Um, whenever you're given the molecular weight, that is going to be vital to figure out what your molecular formula is. So I've actually seen this in a multiple choice question before is, let's say if you had, um, if they asked you to find the molecular formula, but they did not provide you with the molecular weight or molar mass of, of the molecular formula, then I've seen it ask, um, is there like, oh, there, actually, what was it? The last one would say, there's not enough information to answer that question. And that's when you would use that one. So that's something that I've seen on multiple choice questions. So just be aware of that. But yeah, for, to find the molecular formula, you will always need to be given the molecular weight or molecular formulas molar mass is essentially what we're talking about. Okay. So what we're going to do first, and this is if everything's out of 100% um, solution or not solution, sorry, 100% uh, compound, which it is in this case, uh, we would round it's it's 100 and I think point something, but um, it's not too far off. So all we have to do is really just change the percent to grams. We're not changing anything but literally changing that percentage to grams, right? The numbers did not change. So that's totally fine. That's all we have to do so far. So that was our first step. Now that we have everything in grams, I'm gonna move on to the second step. Second step is to convert your grams to moles. And uh, by the way, guys, if you need any help with, let's say, stoichiometry, because this is stoichiometry, this is going grams to, to moles, um, or even, let's say, moles to grams or so on, if you guys still are unfamiliar with stoichiometry, I highly recommend uh, checking out the notes that I have for that. Uh, it's literally the complete guide for stoichiometry. It teaches you how to set up the question. It teaches you how to... I included every single possible way I can possibly think of, like going from grams to of one compound to grams of a different compound, going from liters to one to liters of another, uh, molecules to one to grams of another, like every single possible way that I can 
possibly, you know, change it up. And you can see on your exam, that's exactly what I included there. It's extremely, extremely detailed. Um, and by the way, there is a sale going on that ends today. Uh, if you guys want to put that promo code, put that coupon code of back to school uh, and get that uh, survival guide or that uh, complete guide to stoichiometry for 25% off, make sure to do that because the sale ends today. Okay. So let's continue with this. Let's convert each one of these values to moles. So all we have to do is get the molar mass. So this is going back to your uh, looking back at what the molar mass of, let's say, carbon is looking at your periodic table. So I want to align those across from each other so they can cancel. So I'm going to want to put the grams on the bottom. And then on top, I'll put one mole since that's what uh, molar mass is. Remember, molar mass is units is grams divided by moles. And we can switch this back and forth because this is more like stoichiometry. We always want, we always want the same units across from each other so they can cancel. And then we have moles in this case. So I'll divide and that's how many moles we have. I'm going to do this for every single one that we were given. So for hydrogen as well, hydrogen's molar mass is 1.01 grams, and now that's one mole on top. Divide those two values, and that's what we get. And then next, oxygen's molar mass is 16. We'll divide those values and get this amount for our moles. And then lastly, nitrogen is 14.01. And that's what we'll have, divide, and that's what we'll get. Uh, one thing I have gotten questions on before is, uh, let's say if your, your periodic table doesn't show that hydrogen's mass is 1.01 and it instead shows it's 1.0099 or something like that, uh, if that's what your teacher has given you and that's actually what you're using on like exams or tests, use that value. So the periodic table that I have has these values. Not all periodic tables are actually the same, believe it or not. Why did they do that? I don't know. But um, they, yeah, so I highly recommend just using the periodic table that was initially given to you by your instructor or your professor. Okay, so those are the values. Assume that those are the values that they're going to be using on the exams to grade everything. So, okay, now that we have our moles of everything, the next step is to divide by the lowest amount of moles. So dividing by the lowest amount of moles, which one would be our lowest? Well, the nitrogen, right? That was our smallest amount. So our nitrogen is our lowest, so every single one of these is then gonna be divided by that value, okay? So every single one is divided by that value. And then now we're just going to see what uh, number that's going to give us. So the first one tells us that for carbon, there are three of them. Hydrogen, there's seven. We can round, by the way. If it's like 6.99, 6.98, um, you can round up. That's totally fine. And then except when it's like like 6.5, like when it's 0.5 or point. Um, what was it? 25.33, stuff like that. I highly recommend checking out the video for that. Um, I believe it was empirical formula one because I go over one that actually ends in 0.5 and I show, I show you everything else that you need for that. So make sure to look at that one. And then next for oxygen, it would have been three. And then nitrogen is just one since something divided by itself is one. What these values are telling us, they're telling us the subscript for our empirical formula. So in this case, this tells us that carbon has a subscript of three, hydrogen has a subscript of seven, and then nitrogen has a subscript of one, and oxygen has a subscript of three. Uh, by the way, the way I, I ordered this, I, I know it might have seemed strange or different. Um, you might have wanted to do C-H-O-N. The reason why I didn't do that is because H and O wouldn't bond in that manner. Um, I just personally knew that N and O would bond together. Um, and like C goes with H and then N would go with O. Uh, I kind of dependent on just knowing that, unfortunately, uh, something else that I can think of, but I know you haven't gone over this, is the... Actually, I don't want to say that because you, if you're looking at empirical formulas, you haven't gone to polarity and Lewis structures yet. But I personally knew that C and H were there and then N would, would have bonded to that C and next to the O rather than C-H-O-N. Okay, just know that that would have been the case in, in this sort of situation. Um, and what we're going to do now, because this is, our, this is our empirical formula. We found that. So check, that's done. The next step is to find our molecular formula. So to find our molecular formula, even before doing that, um, let's actually find our molar mass of our empirical formula. So finding the, so this is our empirical formula, finding our molar mass, this is going back to just looking at how many 
carbons we have or how many of each element we have and multiplying that by the mass of that specific element. So C or carbon has three, right, because of that subscript. We'll multiply that by 12, the molar mass of carbon, and that gives us this value and we'll keep going. And then now hydrogen, there are seven, right, going back to that subscript, there are seven and multiply that and that would be 7.07. .07. And then N is just gonna be itself since there's only one. And then oxygen, there are three. Multiply that by the molar mass of oxygen, which is 16. And lastly, add everything together, and that gives us the molar mass of our empirical formula. Now, for the next step, uh, this is going to be very important. What we have to do is divide the molecular weight by the molecular weight, and by the way, that molecular weight that we previously found. So actually that we previously were given. You're going to be dividing the molar, the molecular's, the molecular formula's mole, uh, Molar mass, goodness, <laughs> it's a mouthful. So that's what you're gonna have on top that was initially given to you in this question, divided by the empirical formula's molar mass or weight that we just found. So this is essentially what I'm talking about. And there's a trick to this, there's a trick to remembering this, that please, oh please, don't forget about me, is what I typically say. Um, so me just really means molecular formulas, molar mass on top, and empirical formulas, molar mass on bottom. That's how you can memorize it and just remember it on an exam. Don't forget about me on an exam, okay? So that's kind of what I want you to think of, a little trick. So what I'm gonna do is that on top is I'm just gonna put everything that we were initially given. So that 210 was initially in the question, and on the bottom is what we just found. So we'll divide those two values and we'll get some sort of value. So it's just gonna give you um, a whole number or an integer, and that's gonna be two. With this value, we're gonna multiply that two to the subscripts of every single, to every single subscript of our empirical formula, and then that gives us our molecular formula. So multiplying this all out, our molecular formula is now this value, and that's that would be it in this case, okay? So that's how you figure out your empirical and your molecular formula. All right. All right, so we have time for our last one. This is going into um, a whole bunch of topics, and we'll see how, how much we can get into this. I might um, see how far we can go with this, because this is your question, Ryan. Um, and let's see what we got. Okay, so it says, suppose 25 milliliters of a 2.00 molar solution of a lead to nitrate are combined with 30 mils of 3.50 uh, molar solution of sodium chloride. Okay, the first thing that it's asking is just to write a balanced equation and include your labels. So let's just start off with identifying what lead to nitrate is. This goes back to naming. So naming, uh, we have lead, so lead I know is PB. That two plus is actually telling us here, hold on. So right here, this is two, right? That two Roman numeral always tells us what our charge of our metal is. So that's how I knew it was a two plus charge. Next, this goes back to our polyatomic ions and nitrate is NO3 with a negative one charge. Next, we know that we always have to balance out our charges for ionic compounds, which this is, uh, because it's a metal and a non-metal. And what I have to do is just put a two subscript here. And that's what I'll do. So now this is gonna be our first reactant. And then next, let's look at sodium chloride. Well, sodium is Na with a plus one charge, and chloride is a Cl with a negative one charge. That's completely balanced, so NaCl. All right. So what I want us to look at now is just how we're gonna form our uh, balance equation or how we're gonna form our products. Okay, so what we did is I started off with just our lead nitrate and sodium chloride. What we're gonna do is figure, predict our products by doing that whole inner, inner, outer, outer method. And what I'm talking about with that is there's a trick that I like to do with something like this. This is a, a double replacement reaction or precipitation reaction, they kind of go hand in hand, where I'm gonna combine these two together, okay? So, hold on, let me see if I had it, there you go. So, we have N and NO3, and you always wanna have the metal, which is positively charged first, and then the non-metal, which is negatively charged. So those will combine, and since everything is balanced, that's how we got that NaNO3. And then next, next what we're gonna combine are these two. So our lead, 
lead is a metal, so that was PB with the two plus charge because that's what we found initially. And then CL is a negative one charge. All we need to do is put a two here to balance out the charges and we have this value. I'm sorry, this, this uh, compound. So that's what we have so far. That's how we've predicted our products. By the way, if you guys need help with predicting products, I actually recently made a new video on predicting products of, um, I believe with polyatomic ions is what it was called. Uh, actually, no, sorry. It was predicting products of double replacement reactions. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of videos. <laughs> so, so make sure to check out that one. Um, that one actually was really cool to film and the intro is awesome. So <laughs> I highly recommend checking that one out. Um, so I'm gonna put that in the link um, if you guys need some more help with uh, predicting products. So I balanced out the equation already. I wanna move on to some of the more complex parts of this uh, question. So let's say, uh, oh, by the way, this next part is asking what precipitate forms. All the precipitate is, by the way, it's a solid. It's just talking about when something precipitates, it forms a solid, okay? That's what I want you to think of. So in this case, we would just look at a solubility table. And um, oh, uh, if you guys would like this solubility table, I do have um, it for free for you guys. So what you can do is you can check the description box. You could even click on, I think it says, if, I think it says a uh, free survival guide, free chemistry survival guide. Um, or I can put that right now in the chat. You know, I'll just put that now in the chat. Um, I'll put the free solubility table for you guys to get so you understand how to use this one. But here, let's go over that. Okay, so in this case, PB, uh, actually lead nitrate, essentially what I want you guys to look at for solubility is we're just seeing what type of compound this is, what type of solution is it. And if it's gonna be aqueous, if it's gonna be a solid or whatnot. So if something is soluble, that means it will dissolve in water and it means it's aqueous, okay? So that's what this essentially is saying. If it's insoluble, then that's gonna be a solid. That just means it does not dissolve in water. So that's how we're gonna approach this. Now, how I personally like to approach these questions are nitrate or NO3, that's what I wanna look at first. I always look at the endings. So NO3, I'm gonna look at my table, my solubility table and see where is that? Well, that's right here. So nitrate has no exceptions, meaning it is always going to be soluble no matter what. So I know, okay, this must be aqueous. And I'm gonna keep going with that. So now I'll look at this next one and say, all right, Cl. Well, Cl, that's a halogen. Um, and that's gonna be right here. So that does have an exception. However, it doesn't fall under any of these exceptions, right? There's no Ag, there's no silver, lead, or mercury. We only have uh, sodium. So nope, that's fine. That's gonna be soluble, meaning it's aqueous. And we'll keep going. We'll look here and see Cl. Okay, well, does that fall under the exceptions? Yes, it does. Because it falls under the exceptions that make it soluble, uh, insoluble, that means this is now going to be a solid. So that's our precipitate. And then the last one, once again, was just the fact that this was uh, NO3, so that was nitrate. And we said nitrate has no exceptions to that rule, so this was also aqueous. So that was fine. So our precipitate that forms here is that lead chloride. Okay. So that would have been the case for this one. Okay, so I'm going to, um, yeah, I have time, I think. So let's look at writing the balanced uh, net ionic equation. What we wanna do here for balanced, uh, for net ionic equations in general is we're breaking apart all of our aqueous solutions and only the aqueous solutions. For your solid, you're gonna keep that intact. Same goes for anything that's liquid or a gas, which you really won't see here, but um, you might see a liquid like water. Okay, but in this case, we only have aqueous. We're gonna break everything down into its ions and I'll show you what I mean by that. So we're gonna get this sort of long equation and this is known as our complete ionic equation or I've also heard it as a total ionic equation. And what we did was we broke this apart. So looking back at lead, we still want to identify what our charge would have been, which we stated was a 2 plus. We're also going to state its state, which is aqueous. And then here, I placed a 2 in front because how many nitrates do we have? Well, we have 2 nitrates. And that has a negative 1 charge. And we'll keep going. And this 2 would have actually distributed to both of uh, Na and Cl. So that's why I had 2 Na's and 2 Cl's. Okay, 
Now, continuing on, here we have our solid. We don't touch that. We don't break that apart. We leave that intact, okay? So that's not going to get touched. So then here, I'm going to distribute this two again, and we have two sodiums and two nitrates, and that's our complete ionic equation. What we will do next to find our net ionic equation is cancel out kind of like light terms. So these are called spectator ions. It just means that they're completely dissolved in the solution and they will go away essentially or, or not be part. I don't want to say they go away, but they, they're not going to be part of um, they're not going to be part of our solid. OK, of our precipitate. So instead, we'll see that Na and Na will cancel and NO3 and NO3 will also cancel, leaving us with just the main things that are involved to make that uh, solid or that precipitate. And that will always be the case for a net ionic equation. All right, so this is going to be our net ionic equation. Um, and let's keep going with this types of question. And by the way, guys, I do also have a, um, a video on explaining net ionic equations. I highly recommend checking that out. I go into a lot of detail there. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Okay, next. Limiting reactants. All right. So we're asked to find the limiting reactant in this question, and we're also asked to determine how many grams of precipitate will form. So remember, precipitate just means the solid. So how many grams will our solid form, or, or how many grams of our solid will we have? So what I'm going to start off with is just calculating the limiting reactant. And what I'm going to do uh, first, oh, I think this went backwards. Um, is go from, this is a little bit different because we're actually given a solution and we're not starting off with grams. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from milliliters to, uh, and actually I have that here. I'm gonna go from milliliters of our first reactant to then liters, then to moles, then to moles of our solid, right? Because this is gonna be our multiple ratio. And then lastly, to grams of our uh, precipitate or our solid. So because that's what they want, they want grams of your precipitate to form, okay? And I'm going to do this twice. I'm going to do this both for our, for actually each, each uh, reactant that we were given initially, okay? So I'm going to go from milliliters of one reactant to grams of our precipitate or our solid, which is uh, lead chloride. Okay, so let's set this up. Starting with the 25 mils that we initially were given, I'm going to change this to liters just by 1,000 milliliters on the bottom and one liter on top. Next, this molarity that we were given, this could actually be rewritten as two moles divided by one liter. And that's what we're essentially going to look at, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm placing one liter on the bottom and then two moles of our lead nitrate on top. And then why I'm doing this, it's just so everything can cancel. So this is what we're doing right now. We're just canceling out and we're here at moles of uh, lead nitrate. Next, we want to get to moles of our, our precipitate. So I'm going to do a multiple ratio. There's only one mole of lead nitrate for every one mole of uh, lead chloride. So I'll put that on the bottom, one mole of uh, lead chloride. And lastly, all I need is the molar mass of lead chloride, which will go on top and multiply everything out, divide by 1,000, and this is what we get. We'll do the same exact process for the second reactant, which was sodium chloride. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, once again, I'm just going to change this to liters by using 1,000 milliliters per every one liter. And then next, on the bottom, I'm now going to use the molarity that we had previously, that 3.5. And once again, I can use this 3.5 moles on top. Ah, I ran out of room. Moles on top. Pretend this is moles. Um, and this is one liter. There we go. So that's what we're essentially going to look at here. I'll put one liter on the bottom, 3.5 on top, and then our multiple ratio is next. So how many moles do we have? Well, we have two moles of NaCl for every one mole of our precipitate. Next, once again, we'll just find our molar mass, which we initially did. Multiply everything across, divide by 1,000 times 2, okay, on the bottom, and then this will give us this value. Okay, so to find our limiting reactant, remember our limiting reactant will produce the least amount of product. So in this case, we want the one that produced the least. So this is the this is how much precipitate is actually going to be formed. And our reactant that produced this was, was our lead nitrate. Um, and uh, Ryan just asked, where did you get the two moles of lead nitrate on top? Yeah, so I got that from right here. Okay, 
So I got that from our molarity that was initially given. So this essentially is split up into two moles on top of lead nitrate, okay, of lead nitrate, and then per every one liter of lead nitrate. So remember that molarity is actually moles divided by liters, and that's often used as a conversion factor. So that's how I'm using that two moles on top, and I did the same thing here. Okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> I see that, never mind, perfect. So, okay. So then I, we found that our limiting reactant would have been that uh, lead nitrate. Okay, so that's our lead nitrate. Uh, lead nitrate is our limiting reactant. And then how many, to answer question five, determine how many grams of precipitate is formed. This is the only precipitate that is formed. So whatever your limiting reactant produces is the amount of product that you actually will see. So it's known as the theoretical yield. All that's talking about is how much product is actually formed at the end of the reaction. Okay. That's what I want you to look at it. This served its purpose. That's not actually going to form. Okay. So our last question, part of this question, was uh, determine the concentrations of all the ions remaining in the solution after the reaction takes place. Okay. So with this type of question, since they're asking for so much, they're asking for every single um, ion and everything that was in this uh, reaction or solution, I just want to go back to an ice table. I typically don't use an ice table uh, for limiting reactants just because I personally feel like it's not awesome. <laughs> I don't really like it that much. I don't know. I, I feel like it's confusing. Um, but it, for an ice table, I actually like using it when we have to have all the different concentrations of everything. So that can be helpful. I can see why. And specifically, it is used for like actual solutions. So what an ice table is, by the way, if you guys aren't familiar with this, an ice table is essentially saying or represents the initial values that we had in the very beginning. Uh, by the way, an ice table is only measured in moles. It's not grams or anything else, okay, for that matter. So really, we're, we're just looking at moles in this case. So what we have to do and what I did already was figure out um, how many moles we had for each. And I just want to real quick go over as to how I got these values. So I'll put that over here. Um, but how I got that 0 0.05 was that we initially started off with 25 mils and a two molar solution, right? So I'm going to put that here. So two molar, I'm going to represent that as two moles on top divided by one liter. And um, I'm going to change this real quick to liters. So putting 1000 milliliters on the bottom and then uh, one liter on top multiply this by our molarity that we initially had given to us and two moles on top and one liter on the bottom. Everything cancels and we'll see that we'll have 25 divided by 1,000, um, so really 0 0.025 times 2. And then that's how we got that, that uh, 0 0.05. Okay, so that's how I'm getting the moles. And then we'll do the exact same process um, for NaCl. So with that one, we were given... Oh, what were we given with that? Two point, it was 30, perfect. 30 milliliters. And then initially we were given 3.5 molar solution. So I'm gonna split that apart once again, moles on top and one liter on the bottom. So I'll convert this to liters. So 1000 milliliters and then one liter on top using our molarity as a conversion factor to allow us to get to um, to liters, or sorry, to, mol to moles. There we go. Okay, so then everything will cancel, and this will give us um, 3.5 moles, and that's how I, I actually got the 0 0.105, okay? So, so yeah, that's how I got those initial values, and we always want to convert everything to moles. Now, we are not going to know our initial values of our products because we haven't formed it yet, right? The reaction hasn't taken place. So initial is essentially saying you're given what you initially have in the reaction, okay, to start off. So the next your change a lot of times isn't known just yet. So our change in this case, I'm going to represent this as X. So that's what I'm seeing here. This is going to be a negative X. Remember that your reactants are always going to be negative because they're being used up while your products are being produced. So they're going to be positive because they're actually showing up. So in this next part, what I did was there's actually a two coefficient. And remember that two has to be right here, right? So this was a one, you'll note that this is really one X. 
And then this too also comes down and we'll keep going with this. So now that we're on the product side, it's positive. So we have plus one. And this last part here is plus two X because of that coefficient of two that we had right here. Okay, next up is to add these all up. So all of these are going to be added together. Okay, so adding everything together and that's what's gonna form um, that equal equilibrium or really just the E is kind of saying everything added together. Um, is this the same thing as a BCA table? Yes, and actually I realize I should have possibly put this instead before change and after. Yeah, I, I remember Ryan, that's what you were using before. So yes, it is. Before is what we had initially, right? The change and then after is what happens at the end. So let's actually put that instead because um, ice tables, you'll see that later in, in the semester, yeah. And for everyone who, if you guys are in college, you're gonna see ice tables and BCA tables in uh, the second half of chemistry. General chemistry two is where you see that, okay? So now what I'm gonna do now is how I figured out um, what our change was, it was what our limiting reactant was. So we found that our limiting reactant was the lead nitrate. And in this case, uh, since that's our change, I really said that X must be 0 0.05, right? So that's how I knew. And then we're gonna subtract those two values. So we have nothing left of our limiting reactant. Why? Because it's limiting, right? It was limited already. So we used up all of that resource or all of that reactant and it's gone. So there's no more left. And then our next reactant has to be the excess. So there has to be some left over. So what I'm gonna do is just plug in, we would have plugged in this value for X and then subtract everything and we'll get this amount. So that is how many moles are left over. Now they're asking for concentrations though. So concentrations, remember, are moles divided by liters. So what I have to do is divide by the total amount of liters that were initially given. And how I calculated that was going back to, um, let's do, what was it? 30 and 25, okay. <laughs> like trying to remember what it was. 25 plus 30 milliliters. Okay, and I just changed that to liters. So this would have been 55 milliliters and then I converted that to liters, okay? So that's what I did. It's always divided by the total amount of liters using the solution. And then I would have gotten this value, that's our concentration. I'll do the same thing for the next ones. So here, that's how many moles we'd have. I divide that by the total volume and this gives us this molarity or concentration. Same thing here, I plugged in that 0 0.05, multiplied, multiplied by two, divide by our total amount of volume, and that's all that we have. So like I said, in your, I know this is kind of everywhere, but we saw that, and actually I might just see it here, but um, our lead nitrate, the limiting reactant, produces nothing else that gets completely used up. The only thing remaining is our excess reactant and um, all of our products, okay? So that's essentially what is still left in the solution. Okay, <laughs> so that was everything. Um, I highly recommend, guys, that if you want your questions, you want the chance to get your your uh, questions answered in the next live, tweet me, okay? So I really mean it that I am picking as many tweets as I possibly can and packing them into a lesson to help you guys and understand you know, your homework, understand what your professor is going over right now. Um, so yeah, make sure to tweet me at hello, Melissa M and use the hashtag of ask Melissa Maribel. You can put your chem, you could actually take a picture of your chemistry question if that makes it easier instead of typing it all out. Or if you don't have a specific uh, question, you instead could actually just tell me the topic like, oh, I need help with Lewis structures or something like that, you know? So that's what I highly recommend to do for this week. Um, I as soon as you guys know, I recommend tweeting it because uh, if you tweet too late, then I might have already been done with preparing my lesson, okay? So I, I, I always like to prepare my lesson at least Friday or Saturday just to wait for your guys' tweets to do that. Okay, so make sure to do that. Last, uh, another thing is uh, today is the last day for to get 25% off of all of the notes. So make sure to use the promo code, the coupon code of back to school. And that link to, to shop the notes are in the description box. And 
If you need help with, let's say, online tutoring or homework help, if you're not too sure what's going on, you have a lot of homework questions, I highly recommend checking out the description box. There you will find a lot, and I mean a lot of resources. Okay, so please make sure to check that out. I want you guys to succeed this semester and, well, every semester, but I want you guys to do well. Okay, and yeah, so thank you so much for joining me for this live. Um, if you guys, Thank you for, uh, Celine says, thanks for your help. We'll be tuning in next week. Awesome. Happy to hear. I know it was your first time and I'm so glad that you, you can join me today. So awesome, guys. Thank you for being here today on this Sunday. Um, Ryan says, um, great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so glad that I could answer uh, your guys' questions. And uh, one more little thing. I actually, if you guys don't know, um, I previously actually just won a Next Up uh, contest uh, for YouTube. It's a YouTube contest, and I will be going actually after this in a couple hours, heading over to my hotel to then go on the week-long uh, creator camp that they have for us. So I'll be showing all the behind the scenes of the YouTube space and YouTube in general on my Instagram stories. So if you guys want to follow me along there, um, I can put my Instagram handle and my Instagram in the chat right now uh, if you guys want to see all the awesome things that YouTube has planned, which I don't even know and I'm super excited uh, to just go. So I know there's going to be events and celebrities supposedly, so that'll be cool. Um, I'm always kind of tutoring, so this will be interesting to get out. But yeah, I'm super excited and I hope you guys can follow and watch the Instagram stories there. Um, other than that, I hope you have an awesome and blessed week and have an awesome Sunday. I'll see you guys in the next live. See you guys.